Hey, Tommy, we've got a fun-filled show today because we are going to be talking about, oh my, an electric Jeep, an all-electric Jeep. That's right, exactly. So not only one, but three all-electric Jeeps. Yeah, as you know, it was 4 by e day this week. Uh, we're going to go over what Jeep has in store for electrification. And then we're going to talk about some 90s stuff. That's like your era, isn't it? You were born in the 90s. Uh, yeah, I, that's true. I was, I was 97. That's me. Um, and, first of all, we have to talk about the stools. Why are the stools so tall now? Because we changed out the other ones because our back was killing us from sitting on them. So these are nice. They give you back support. Anyway, let's talk about cars and not stools. This is not stool talk. Yeah, but the issue this with is the stool. TFL talk. The issue with the stool is that the back kind of ends midway to your lower back. So you don't really have, there's tell not you, really that much back Tell you what, support. next time you go on eBay, actually this was on Amazon and order them, and you pick the ones you like, okay? They also, do you hear this? They got a little squeak action. Oh, for God's sakes. I'm not sure your stools have been an immediate hit. Oh, for God's sakes. We have four of them, too. So, uh, <laughs> like I say, you know, if you can't be part of the solution, please don't be part of the problem. Well, I'm just questioning your thought process no, because I'm, you bought the brown stools. Yes, because no brown is classy. But nothing in the room is brown. Brown is classy. It just looks good right now. Is I like it? brown. Is it? I'm in a brown kind of mood. The other thing we're going to talk about is, and we'll tell you this at the end of the show, we just bought a brand new old car for us, a really classic old car uh, that I've been looking for for a long time and it's badass, so we'll tell you what that is. But don't tell them yet, uh, because it is a really cool... I'll give you the year. It's 1972. One of the coolest cars built in 1972. Yeah, these stools are not it. We're going to have to get new stools. Fine. That's these fine. are just not happening. That, that's fine. You order them. <laughs> you, you, you put them together when they show up. Did you have to put them together? No, Zach did. Well, there you go. But you, you get to put them together because I'm not having to do it again. This is a low-pressure situation. And, and then I will I will tear into your new stools. I'm not tearing into them. I'm just saying they're not very good. And you I'm are questioning tearing, why you that's bought exactly them. What, that's exactly what you're doing. You're tearing into the stools. All right. So let's start with um, Jeep 4 by e day As you know, uh, Jeep has been slowly, I would say, electrifying. We have now two 4 by es the 4 by e Wrangler and the 4 by e Grand Cherokee. And 4 by e is basically a hybrid powertrain where the vehicle gets anywhere from 20 to 30 miles of range, uh, and then it has a traditional engine as well uh, that powers the vehicle. We've taken the Wrangler 4 by e off-road. We just took the Grand uh, Cherokee 4 by e off-road. But now they've gone into the deep end of the electrification pool, and they have actually come out and introduced what, Tommy? Well, we have uh, basically three new models, um, fully electrified models, and a couple other things about their plan, right? So they say that the Jeep full lineup will be electrified by 2025. Now, that doesn't mean that every Jeep will be fully electric by 2025, but we'll probably at least have like a plug-in version. Um, now, the three models they introduced are the Jeep Avenger, the Jeep Wagoneer S, and the Jeep Recon. But what they didn't talk about, which if you kind of read between the lines, is that they say the full Jeep lineup will be electrified by 2025. That means there's going to have to be an electrified version of the Grand Wagoneer, electrified version of the Gladiator. Renegade. Renegade. That's right. Compass. Wagoneer. Cherokee. Standard Wagoneer. So I think we're going to see a lot of maybe plug-in hybrids, maybe standard hybrids on all these models in the Grand near future. Grand Cherokee L. Very true, yeah. I mean, it says, they said that the full Jeep lineup will be electrified by 2025, and they also said that half of its U.S. brand sales um, are to be all electric by 2030. So uh, let's just quickly talk about the Avenger, because that's the one we don't get. That's only European only. Tell me about that. So it is a very, 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 very small SUV. Now, in the presentation, they said that there's not a market here for tiny SUV. But I kind of disagree because it's smaller than the Renegade, and they said that class doesn't exist. But we actually see that class popping up now, vehicles like the Hyundai Venue, right? These little itty-bitty pint-sized um, pocket SUVs, and they're great, like really cool little size. But they're convinced that it wouldn't work in the U.S., so the Avenger is sub-Renegade-sized. So can, no. I, can I make a comment on that? Yeah. So in Europe, those cars would be called city cars, uh -huh. right? Like the Volkswagen Up. Mm -mm. Yes, that's a city car, Tommy. The Volkswagen Up is a city car. That's exactly what it but is. But not the Avenger. Because well, the Avenger, they the say... The size class would be city car. They say the Avenger is a Jeep. It's, the, uh, no, it's bigger than the Up. Because the Up, I think, is, is even smaller than the Avenger. The Up is really tiny. That's like a sub-city car. No, that's a city like car. A, the like up a, is the, it's like the, a village car. The Up is a classic European city car, along with the smart car, along with, uh, you know, there are all these series of cars that we don't get that work really well if you're in downtown Paris or... 
you know, pick a European city, Rome, because, you know, the streets are small and the people are small, <laughs> like the, us the, big the Americans. <laughs> Not that small. <laughs> so uh, uh, I think that city cars actually would work in America, uh, but uh, we just haven't had uh, a manufacturer that has had the foresight or the, I would say, uh, wisdom to know how to sell them to Americans, right? What do you mean? You can't take like, what you can't do is take a European model, which for instance, in the case of the Smart, is a diesel, right? Because that's what everybody wanted in Europe, and then try to transplant it and sell it here. Uh, so you, you need to you need to Ameri- Americanize it. <laughs> what do you mean? The Fiat 500 now available with a Big Mac holder. Like, what do you mean Americanize it? Well, there's you can go one of two ways, all right? You could either make it small and luxurious and expensive, or you could make it small and very affordable. Pick one of those two. So a, a classic example of making it expensive, which went haywire, was, of course, the Aston Martin Signet, right, where they took the Toyota IQ and, you know, Put a put lipstick on a pig, basically. Put some very expensive leather in there. You know, made it seem expensive, and then they sold it as an expensive. What you have to do is you, small things can be luxurious, but then they have to be designed in such a way, right? They have to start out as being um, pricey uh, and being uh, so that the, that the that the reputation of the vehicle becomes desirable versus just small and cheap. So I think if you go that route, if you make it luxurious but yet precious at the same time, then people will buy it. Some would say there's a brand out there that did exactly that. What would that be? A brand that did nothing but small premium cars. Okay, which one? Some would say I own three of them. <laughs> Mini? Yeah. So Mini, when they came to the U.S., they were an expensive premium tiny car. Um, and, and, and that's when they sold the most. When they went, when they went like Volkswagen Golf size, which is what they are now, right? They're not selling as much. Well, I think that their biggest year was probably when they introduced the Countryman. I think that's when they probably sold the most units, actually. And, and even that Countryman was small compared to the current one. I, you know, Dad, I'm just not sure small cars work in the U.S. So we've had we've had the Mini Mini brand, right? Which yep. was very very small cars, um, premium. We tried Smart Car which for the U.S. was not a diesel. It was gasoline only. Uh, we had the Fiat 500. It wasn't gasoline. It was also electric in the second gen. Yeah, in the second gen, it was also electric. Um, but in the States, it was gas or electric, no yep. diesel. We had the Fiat 500, right, which was an iconic city car that they sold millions of in Europe. Just didn't sell in the U.S. But none of those were premium brands. But the Mini's premium. The Mini's a BMW. The mini, mini, mini is trying to be premium, but there, it isn't premium. What I'm saying is if you took a small Mercedes, and I'm not talking about a smart car, or a small Lexus, or a small Audi, and made it premium, I think people would buy it here in America. Or well, or go the exact opposite way. If you're going to go small, make it affordable. So they actually did, they also sell a small uh, Mercedes here now. So the, the tiny Mercedes in Europe was the A-Class, and now they, they sell it in the States, so you can buy an A-Class. Yeah, but that one is, is not a great car. The better... Example, well, the be- well, it's just not. It's not a good A class. Is not a good Mercedes. Sorry. The better example of that is the B class. That's a good Mercedes. But that's big. It's compared well, to a well, city but car. It's, it's, it, we're kind of talking about what what I'm saying is there's value there, right? It's small because it has three rows. I think it might be one outside of the old Mitsubishi, the last generation, right? Outlander. Uh, the current one, they got, didn't they get rid of the third row or does it still have it? So the Outlander, I think, has a third row. So the, the Outlander has it and the B-Class has it. Those are the only two small-ish vehicles that actually have a third row. Yeah, but they're not city cars. No, they're not city I cars. mean, a B-Class and a, a GLB in Germany is a, <laughs> a pretty big car. Anyway, I understand your point. You're saying you, you, traditionally Americans have not loved... Yeah, we just don't do the whole city car thing. ...of small cars. But I'm just saying because we haven't hit upon the right formula yet. I mean, I think another great example of... Our, so the first-gen smart that we got in the States was pretty pretty poop. Um, but the second-gen uh, for the States, or the third-gen globally, was actually really, really good. It had a turbocharged engine, dual-clutch transmission, and it was pretty uh, pretty well Well, the first equipped. one had that horrible three-speed, right, that, that just... Didn't the fir- didn't they both the first and second have it like a horrible three speed? Uh, no, no, no. So the the first gens had an automated manual transmission. Right, that was horrible, just horrible. But the second gens have a dual clutch, so it's a good transmission and it's a really cool little turbo engine. It's out of the Twingo. Um, so that is a really good car, actually. Like the the, the last smarts that they sold before they went. Yeah, up. but th- by that point, the die had been cast. Are you enjoying playing with those glasses? It's kind of bugging me watching you play with your glasses. I'm just trying to figure out why they're all bent here. They're you know, all they're what? all screwed up. Can you leave that till the end of the podcast? Why is it bugging it, you? It's just taking. It, I feel like 
I, I'm not paying attention to what we're saying, but paying attention to you playing with your. No, glasses. I'm just I'm just a fidgeter. Yes, you know, I, know. I, need, I, I need to that. fidget. But with it makes something. me nervous watching you fidget. I know, but it makes me nervous not fidgeting. That's this pickle. Well, I, I just, I just, I just, I, I would appreciate it if you didn't fidget with your glasses while we're trying to do the podcast. If you'd be so kind to put off the fidgeting for the next forty-five minutes, I need to get like a fidget spinner or something. Yeah, that'd be great. Anyway, uh, by that point, like I was saying, and we can we can discuss this as much as you want, but I think the die had been cast. You know, Mercedes did not put their best foot forward when they came out with the smart from any perspective. Right? What happened was, I remember actually listening with your with your grandma. We went to a Mercedes Smart dealership, right? Because she wanted one. She like loved the idea of the car. She thought it was great. Uh, she thought it'd be perfect for her needs. We get there and they're like, "Oh no, 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 no! You have to make an appointment to come and look." And I'm like, "We have to make an appointment to come and look at the car." This was not the American business model that I had been used to for how you sell cars, right? We, here, you sell cars off of the lot and you pick the color and the spec you want. You don't come in there and they're like, uh, "We can't show you that car." Well, you can look at it, but if you want to drive it, you have to come back and make an appointment. And that happened to a lot of people. Somehow, Mercedes decided that the best way to sell these things was to make them exclusive, not by actually building an exclusive car, but by making the sales process exclusive. Kind of uh, the way that VinFast, I think, is really about to screw up their business model in America. You know what VinFast is doing? No, what are they doing? They're doing, I think uh, Peugeot did this uh, with the Twingo. Uh, They've got this business model Okay, let's take a step back. You know what VinFast is, right? Yeah. So it's a, it's a Vietnamese uh, car company that until now uh, was best known for rebranding BMWs. Mm-hmm. And now they started building their own cars. And they decided to come to America and sell a full line of electric-only vehicles. They're building out dealerships in California as we speak. Uh, and their business model is a failed business model that did not work in Europe. And the business model that did not work in Europe was to separate the sale of the car from the battery. So you buy the car, Tommy, but you lease the battery. Right. Although and how do you resell that? I think it works in China. Doesn't don't they do this in China a lot too? And it's pretty I think popular. in China they have swappable batteries, which is different. So you can swap batteries. Here what you're doing is you're separating the purchase of the vehicle. Not you're not swapping the battery, you're separating it. So you buy the car yeah, it, and then there's a separate contract to lease the battery. So it's been done in the past in the States. Um, is it? Yeah. So the, the the last smart electric, you could actually have a battery lease program. So I thought they leased those for ninety nine bucks a month in California. Uh, no, but the battery you could also have a separate battery lease program. So in Europe, what happened was it, it became so problematic to figure out like how you resell a car like that that I think Peugeot actually gave up on it and just wrote off all those battery leases. And to make it worse, been fast. If you're listening, I would love to get somebody from your company on board on this podcast to talk about exactly how you plan to make this work. To make it worse, Tommy, so VinFast, please call me, ask at tfltruck.com or info at tflcar. We'd love to uh, get you on the podcast. To make it worse, they're only giving you something like 500 miles a month, not a week, Tommy, a month on the battery release, after which you, I think it's you pay a, a penny a mile, mm. which is you know pretty expensive. So, yeah, check this out. So this was an old report of smart cars, yeah. but um, you could. You could lease the battery separate from the car, which is kind of a – I don't think it's a terrible idea, right? Because the, the idea is um, the battery is going to be the first thing in a lot of people's minds that's, that's going to fail. That's what they're really worried about. And there's a lot of people, I think, that don't want to own the battery but do want to own the car, right? They want to just pay someone to take care of the battery, and then if the battery fails. So, so why don't you do that? I'm holding up my iPhone, guys. Why don't you do that with the iPhone? Because your your iPhone battery is not twenty thousand dollars. I was just saying it, it, it's a, it doesn't work on a tiny scale, but it would work on a full. But it hasn't scale. worked. It didn't work for. I mean, smart smart guy to the point where they were leasing cars for ninety nine bucks a month, battery and all, and they couldn't give those things away. Well, right. and same thing happened with the Fiat five hundred ninety nine ninety eight bucks a month, if I remember right, on those compliance cars, they couldn't give them away. So that's another case for all, only California. Um, yeah, and, but, but California leads the nation. And we just says. talked about how city cars don't work in the states. And the VinFast is not a city car; it's like a no, no. It's a it's an SUV. There's, right. a, there's a whole model line. I'm just saying, Tommy, it makes for a nightmare because when you go to sell it, how do you sell it without the battery? So let's say that you buy. Let's just let's kind of walk through what happened in Europe, right? You you go in the VinFast dealer and you buy the car. So you pay less for the car, obviously, because you're not buying, right? So that's mm-hmm. a way to get you for less. So let's say I don't know. We can go to their website and see how much they charge for the car. But let's say you pay 20000 for the car, and then you sign up for the lease on the battery. And two months from now, you're like, ugh, 
I don't want this car. I don't like it. So how do you sell that? Well, you, you have to transfer the lease somehow. It's got to be a solution. Uh huh. The solution. Or you in, buy out the battery. The solution in Europe was they gave up on it. I, they're not though. This is the uh, Renault Group page right here, and this is uh, it's a Zoe. Exactly yeah. right. The Zoe. They did that was a Zoe. Yeah. So let's see. Uh, I think you can still do it, right? I don't know. I just, I just, I think they wrote them off. It was that it became that much of a like a logistic nightmare. Uh, go to the VinFast. Yeah, there you go. We're no ends battery leasing yeah. for Zoe. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how you sell them. Yeah, exactly. Um, but <laughs> Zoe I, couldn't figure it out either. I do know it was a really big price drop by going by not owning the battery. You saved several thousand. Oh, oh yeah, sure. UK pounds. Uh, and let's talk about the other thing there, which is also interesting. So you made an assumption, which I, I think the facts don't bear out. You said the reason you want to do that is because the battery is the thing that's going to go on the car. And yet we know now that after 12 years of Teslas, Teslas are seeing battery degradation of anywhere on the low end of between 5 and maybe 20% on the high end. So you're only seeing like in general 10% of the battery capacity going down after 10 to 12 years. So that to me says that the battery degradation is nowhere near what people somehow have in their heads. And I think you, you actually had the right answer to the wrong question. And the right answer was the way the phone works, the way my phone works is after a year, right, I barely get like a half a day of usage out of this before I have to plug it in. Whereas when you get it, it's two days. Mm -hmm. So that to me would suggest that the degradation on this phone battery is something like 50%. Whereas with car batteries, it doesn't have the same work cycle. And now here, of course, I'm just guessing as to why that is, but Teslas have shown that they still have 90% of the capacity of the battery after 10 years, which is pretty darn good, dude, which to me would suggest that you don't really need to lease the battery if you're worried about degradation because it's not going to degrade. Yeah, it's it's true, but it, I mean, it's not, a, it's not an idea that I'm completely opposed to because the battery is the most expensive part typically of an EV, right? It's kind of like a plane. So the person who owns the planes typically don't own the engines, if you, if you didn't realize. So like on a, in an airplane. You mean big planes? Like an airplane, like a 737. Oh, not private planes. No, no, like those okay. engines are typically leased by a... Like those Rolls Royce, but most planes are also leased. I know that. Right, but there'll be a separate lease for the engines. Yeah, but that's a commercial vehicle. Apart from the, the airframe. That's a commercial vehicle, and, and you do that for business case reasons, not for trying to sell as many as possible, which is, I suspect, the reason that VinFast is doing it. Um... So this is according to uh, this website called just EVs. So in, on the Zoe, it was about 5,000 more expensive if you weren't wanted to purchase the battery versus lease it. And then the, the basic battery rental was 49 pounds per month. And then it says, you are looking at 100 months of ownership before the cost levels out. And this time, uh, the lease car will have its battery health guaranteed continuously. And the car will be provided with ongoing 24-7 breakdown cover, not to mention the fact that depreciation predictions would say that you will lose a lot more money if in a battery-owned model. So that that's what this was saying. So not only... Um, anyway, I think the lesson there is they didn't work. They ended it. They didn't expand it. They killed it. Yeah. So anyway, so let's get back to uh, what we were talking about, which is the 4 by e day. Uh, so tell me about the one that we are going to get, not the Avenger, but the... So we're getting a model called the Wagoneer. Okay. Wagoneer S. So this is an all-new... Do you have a picture of it? Can you put it up there? Do um, you mind? Yeah. I'd love to see it. This is an all-new uh, electric Jeep called the Wagoneer S, or at least codenamed. And it is looking to be something pretty different from the current lineup. So the current Wagoneer is very squared off, very kind of um, muscular looking. The new Wagoneer S concept is very swoopy, very futuristic. It looks like a Range Rover. Um, they're predicting 600 horsepower, 400 miles of range, and 0 to 60 in around 3.5 seconds standard four-wheel drive. Let me ask you this. We kind of brushed over this. Are you at all upset or worried or happy that they went all electric or they are going all electric? Is there, you know, that's a, the Jeep is about as classic American brand as apple pie. Uh, and does it worry you or does it upset you that they've gone or going all electric? I mean, Sergio said this like, Seven years ago now, he said they were going to go electric, but, you know, it was something that nobody believed. But now it's actually, like, it seems to be happening. Well, very slowly. They're saying they're going to go half of its U.S. brand sales are going to be all electric by 2030. So that's not exactly like a very fast transition. Do you think the people, the, the buyers of Jeeps are going to be upset by that? 
Well, I think some are, but I think that those that are are still going to have a lot of time to buy gasoline-oriented models. True that. Yeah, so here's, here's something we can talk about. Um, and this is, I think, uh, uh, something that um, is happening in, in a lot of our media right now, and that is uh, a lot of times we, we have lost uh, fair and objective reporting because um, you make more money by lying than you do by telling the truth. And I'll give you an example of that. I'll, I'll make a statement, Tommy, and this happened recently over the last weekend, Labor Day weekend, and there, there are three direct lies in the statement. Three, okay? In one, in one statement, there'll be three lies, okay? And this is, this is a story that went out over Labor Day weekend. They said, the California, California's government has recently banned all uh, internal combustion cars, and to make matters worse, they're also telling people that they can't charge their electric cars over the long Labor Day weekend. Three lies in that statement. Mm -hmm. Should I break it down to you? And sure. Because this is the story and the comments we're getting. So the first lie is uh, that uh, the California government has not banned all electric cars. What they've said is that by 2035, uh, only hybrids and electric cars. And a hybrid, of course, has an internal combustion engine. So it makes it seem like, and it's a small distinction, but a great way to, is that the chair? Yeah. Sounds like you're farting. Yeah, it's a chair. Is it 2030 or 2035? 30, 2035. Okay. So it's a great way to lie by basically taking a kernel of truth, but then co uh, conflating that truth with something that uh, is a lie, right? And the conflation there is all internal combustion engine cars, because obviously that scares people. But the fact was it was hybrids are still allowed. Uh, and it's only all new electric cars, so you can still go and sell like used electric cars. You can still go and buy a, um, I don't know, a TRX if you want in 2035. You just can't be a new one unless there's a hybrid battery in it, right? So that was the first lie in that statement. Okay, um, the second lie in that statement was that they're uh, telling people not to charge their electric cars over the Memorial Day weekend. In fact, there's two lies there. The first lie was that the California government didn't say that. Their utility board said, please do not charge your electric car. So it wasn't the government, it, but it's much sexier to say government as opposed to utility board because they're very separate things, right? A utility board is not the government. It's, a, it's this weird kind of uh, semi uh, Biz, it's a, a semi-private, semi-public structure utilities. And the biggest lie there was nobody said you couldn't charge them. They said they recommended that you didn't charge them from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. when the grid was being most stressed. So in that one statement, three lies, and yet that was a story that went out. That's the story that people kept you know, commenting on our videos. That was the great irony that, you know, because it, it makes for good news, right? Oh, California bans all electric cars, and now they're saying no, that, that you can't. They ban all gas cars. You keep saying they oh, keep banning oh, sorry. all electric oh, cars. sorry. California bans all gas cars, and now they're saying that you can't charge electric cars, right? That's the sexy and ironic story, and none of that was really true when you dig into it. So should we keep going with the wagon here? Sure. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, very swoopy. You, you didn't like that. Well, I just don't have anything to add to okay. it. Right. Yeah. Right. Fair enough. All right. All right. Very um, swoopy. Yeah, it's very swoopy, very kind of, um, uh, I like, like I said, very, very Range Rover. Now, we don't have pricing, but based on some of these figures, like 600 horsepower, 400 miles on a single charge, I think it's going to be quite expensive. And it's a little confusing because if you look at the front of the vehicle, it says Wagoneer. The whole Jeep SUV situation of the Wagoneer name is kind of a disaster. So you have the Wagoneer, which starts at like 57 and goes through like, I don't know, 80 something. You got the Grand Wagoneer that starts at like, what, 70 something and goes through like 100 something. And then you got this swoopy thing, which looks nothing like the other two. It's just a little bit overwhelming. I'm just looking up a story that I saw in Jalopnik today, and I think they probably said it uh, best. Uh, so let me. Because this certainly looks a lot more like a Grand Cherokee than a Wagoneer. So I think it's a little bit tricky to kind of educate the consumer as to what does what, especially since this carries the Wagoneer nameplate. But if you're interested in this, reservations open for U.S. customers in early 2023, and it's supposed to go into production in North America in 2024. Um, Jeep did not say where in North America it's going to be built, and those details are coming closer to launch. So that is the situation with the Wagoneer.
And what's the one that everybody's talking about? The one that looks like a little baby. Well, it looks like it looks like a renegade. Uh, kind of had. Uh, well, you keep saying that. I don't see a lot had of. Had a child with a. You don't. See, what you you think it's so? This one's called, of course, the Recon. Yeah. So it's a separate model. You want to put it up there? Yep. It's not related to anything else, as far as we know of, but it's a squared off, open top, open door Jeep. That's not a Wrangler. It's uh, it's called the Recon, like you said, and it kind of looks like a cross between a Honda Element and a Jeep Wrangler. So it's got lots of kind of squared offness in the front end, like a Honda Element, lots of cladding. Um, but it's got the door off capability and the power top similarity to a Wrangler. Now, it doesn't appear to have a roll cage or a, a sports bar, I should say, like a Jeep Wrangler. It appears to be kind of like a one-piece unibody situation with the canvas top, similar to like a, a Liberty, actually, like an older Liberty. But it's a true off-roader, or so they're saying. So let me let me read exactly what they said here on this page. Oh, well, before you do that, wh- what happened to Jalopnik, by the way? What I do you mean, mean? I, I know the entire staff left uh, and started their own. A lot of you know, Utopia started a lot of their own things. But I'm on their website, Tommy. It's this. This is like a, a, a billboard in downtown Tokyo. I, I can't find the story. There's stuff that's like popping out at me. There's stuff that's flashing. Uh, there's you know, there's videos that are playing. What, what Jalopnik? We're not idiots here, guys. Just give us you know, if you want us to read, which is already hard, right? Because everybody wants to watch videos. Make it legible. Is that asking too much? Um. So the recon. I guess that's a no. I have no comment. You, why not? Well, because I like the guys at Jalopnik. They're nice. They do good did work. Did you see the What did you see the page? I'm not saying that the, the 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 writing's bad. I'm just saying it's 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 almost unreadable because there's stuff popping out at me. There's stuff <laughs> videos that are playing. Like there's a video playing right there. The page shifts around. More every, to do with every, their, every third every third little thing is an ad, right? I think it's more to do with their website ownership than the. Well, um, I'm not I'm not blaming the writers. I mean, a lot of the writers have left, but but okay, website ownership. If you want people to read your stories and click on them, make them readable. Yeah. So the recon is said to be inspired by the Wrangler, although... Um, I don't like the slab sidedness. Yeah. So it, people are saying it looks like a Bronco Sport um, in, a little in bit. certain angles. It looks, I don't like the slab sidedness on the Grand Wagoneer. I don't like it on this vehicle. You're saying it looks like a cross between a Wrangler and an Element, right? Yeah, an old Honda Element. Yeah. yeah. So unlike the Wrangler, where it's got like definition between the hood and the front fenders, it kind of mends into one, similar to a Bronco on this. But 100% Jeep is what they're saying. 100% 4x4, 100% zero emissions. True trail rated capability is what they're saying with select terrain modes. Um, E-locker technology. And they said that it will be able to uh, cross the Rubicon Trail and reach the end with enough range to drive back to town and recharge. What do you think of that? I think that's scary. Why is that? Because if it had a lot of range, they would say the first Jeep that can go over 200 miles or 300 miles on pure electricity. If it doesn't have a lot of range, then they'll be the marketing folks will put the spin on it saying, hey, it doesn't have a lot of range. Why don't we say it can cross the Rubicon and get to a charger? Well, the other thing too, Dad, is it's clearly in pretty early phases. Um, I mean, I think the most we've seen are these renderings and then they had like a product presentation and they had a mock-up behind them. But maybe they just don't know how far it'll go. But why don't they set? Why not? They, they can say something like, "We've set an engineering goal of getting at least 250 miles of range, which is a number that you need." I mean, they know how far you need to go to be competitive in today's market, right? Uh, when you think about the fact that not that long ago, 100 miles was a target. Today, because of the, the Ionic Five, the Tesla Model Y, the real number is. 250, and if you want to stand out, you got to go 300. Uh, you know, luxury brands like the Porsche Taycan can probably get away with going a little bit less, uh, and then some luxury brands like the Lucid are going a lot further, up to 500. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so you know where the the, the like the like, like the, the sweet spot in the market is. So, why are you giving me this enough to do with the Rubicon Trail and get to a Charger? I don't know what that means. To me, that screams reading between the lines that it doesn't have a lot of range. Well. I'm, I'm, you set a goal of 250 miles. Can you say that? But when, yeah. No? We set a goal of over 200 miles. We yeah. set a goal of over 150. I, I don't know. Pick a number. So the issue is, I think realistically, if I take, take a guess, I'm going to say it's going to have 230 miles of range. 
Okay. Based on the form factor. We don't know the size. They had a they had it next to some people in the presentation, and it kind of looks like it's a little smaller than a Wrangler. Well, we know that with our Lightning, when we put on off-road tires, it took 10% of the range out of it. So when they when we asked them um, in the, the, the media conference mm-hmm. about how big it was, uh, they were kind of like, so someone asked, like, is it bigger than a Wrangler? And they're like, well, it depends. So the way I interpreted that is it's like somewhere in between two-door Wrangler and four-door Wrangler in uh, size. I just, I worry, Tommy. I am so worried. I, I love Jeep. It's one of my favorite, you know, we, we, we try to be agnostic here and not pick sides because obviously we want to give every vehicle and every brand a chance. But, I you know, I, I, I have to say I really enjoy the brand. I think it's a strong brand, and I'm really worried about their future because as far as I can tell, um, Europeans, and I don't want to just pick on the French because, as you know, uh, you know, Jeep was bought by Peugeot, but Europeans in general. No. Citroën, isn't it? That's Peugeot. Well, Google it. It's not Stellantis? Peugeot. No, no, that's uh, Citroën. Citroën. It was a Citroën? Yeah, because Peugeot is PSA, which uh, is Nissan. Oh, PSA, yeah, you're right, so it is Citroën. Um, anyway, Europeans just don't seem to get American off-roading. I'm not saying they don't get off-roading. They don't seem to get American oh. off-roading. What? It doesn't matter. We were both right. Right. Stellantis is what cars does Stellantis make up? Should we get the full list for American viewers? Stellantis Global. Here we go. Um, okay, this is not what I needed. No, this is not what you needed. Um, I thought you had it there. I did, but I don't know if I trust his website. What's the website? Stellantis Brands. So. Citroen Peugeot. Group PSA. PSA is Peugeot, Citroen, oh, DS, yeah. Yeah. Opel. Opel Voxel. Yeah, so it was. We were both right. We were both right. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think that's right. Wikipedia will tell us. Here we go. Citroen, Peugeot. Yeah, both Citroen and Peugeot. I didn't know that. Learned yeah. something new today. Anyway, like I said, I, I just don't I don't think Europeans get American. Well, so uh, you don't uh, like this thing? You don't like this Jeep Recon? I think it's cool. I don't know what to think about it. Well, so here's why I think it's cool. So they couldn't... I don't know what to think about it. It's, I think it's a really good tactical move because if they had come out and said, look, it's a new electric Wrangler, people would have lost it because the Wrangler is, you know, nameplate that dates back to 87, but the design dates back to 41. It's like iconic Jeep. And those are like a lot of old school purists in there that want their Wranglers with dinosaur burning engines. So what they did instead was come out with this new model, which kind of embraces a lot of the spirit of the Wrangler. Like, look at this picture, right? They say you can take the doors off. Um, you can take the you windows out. The, why do you keep showing me in the I don't know. You just, bar? You just that, keep popping that, up there. How does that happen? But, like, look at this, right? Doors off, right? Rubicon trail worthy. Uh, but it could be independent suspension. It could be um, unibody, which is what it looks like it is in the picture. So, so what's the difference between that and a Renegade? The fact you can remove the doors? Well, can you take the doors off a Renegade? Bes- besides the fact you can take the doors. Well, off. a Renegade doesn't have a power top roof. A Renegade doesn't have a front trunk. A Renegade's not electric. A Renegade doesn't have locking diffs. Like, there's a lot of cool stuff in this. Okay. So I didn't know that. So I'm, Yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm no, learning. I'm not, not trying to be no, I'm facetious. Learning. I'm just yeah. saying. It's an interesting idea where they can show the world what zero emission capability can be without touching the Wrangler nameplates. And then who knows? Maybe one day this model will turn into the Wrangler or there'll be a... A fully electric Wrangler, which is based on this. I don't so, know. So, so here's here's kind of what I was hoping for, okay? Uh, and what they gave me was a uh, Renegade with that you can take the doors off. Okay, that's what they gave me. <laughs> what? Well, well, no, though. no. Here's what I was hoping for. All right. So Dodge just came out with their new uh, electric line of uh, vehicles, right? And the one that they highlighted, the the prototype, was a new two door Charger. You saw that, right? Yeah. Daytona. SRT, Banshee, Banshee, right? And what they did was, and, and they got a lot of guff for it from certain, you know, high end. Uh, I'm gonna call them podcast, you know, the Porsche, the Porsche people of the world. The fact that not only does it have a manual transmission or or a transmission that simulates a manual, where it actually simulates the shifts, right? But there's also this thing where it like makes a sound that yeah, the it, fake engine note. Right, which is actually not, it's not done through speaker. They actually took real tubes and they run sound through the tubes, like echoing tubes, and it comes up with a sound that's 100 and some 20 or 23, I think. But did you hear the rev? Yeah, I heard it. Of course I heard it. It's like, but 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 at least it's it's something that's innovative and different. And whether you like that idea or not, right? (laughs) On first glance, having an electric motor 
which does need a transmission simulate like gear shift seems kind of wacky, right? But 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 what they're but what they're saying is we know our customers they like the shift, they like that feel, so we're going to give it to them in an electric car to make the transition maybe more palatable, and they like the sound of their cars, and they're the first ones that have come out with something that doesn't sound like something out of like like you know Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I, I back up that Ford Lightning, and I'm like I'm like what the hell is this sound? Seriously, <laughs> right? It's it's the goofiest sound in the world. It's like, like, like why would a Ford Lightning make that sound? I think it was <laughs> it was it was. It was tactically a really bad thing that they did it sounds like a cow you so, know, puking so the issue is is they th- this thing went viral on tiktok and social media of this banshee going through this crowd and revving right and it sounds just like you're playing a gran turismo game and you selected the hellcat and played over speakers it's like <laughs> and it just sounds <laughs> so fake and artificial and it's just like why so, what, so what are you doing so wait so are you do you oppose the idea or do you oppose the execution or Everything. do you oppose both of it? Both all of it. If you're going to embrace okay. electric technology, embrace it for what it's good at. That's why I think actually that this is cool because all of what we see on the recon is functional. Like the e-locking disc, right? Could be very very functional. The um ability e-lockers, to we've known e-lockers are are not good. We we know well, we know that e-lockers are not as good as traditional lockers. So e-lockers can mean a lot of things. So in a rank like a Rubicon Wrangler is e-lockers. E-lockers just means electronic lockers. Right, but uh, when when you have a in, in an electric vehicle, an e-locker means that basically what you're doing is you're using software to lock the torque going to the two wheels in the front or in the back in a 50/50 way. But because of the stability control, it never works as advertised. Well, and and a good example of that would be like the Hummer EV. And I think that's why – I'm sorry, I don't want to cut you off, but let me finish and then you you say your bit. That's why I'm so happy that the Lightning went with the traditional locker, right? There's a, It's a electronically actuated, which is a traditional e-locker, right, where you're electronically actuated, but there's real gears that actually mesh and lock up versus software that's telling the motor to basically allocate torque in the same amount to both wheels. First of all, I've never spent any time in the Hummer EV. I've heard it's pretty impressive for what it can do. I mean, it's done a lot of the a lot of, the, enough, lot of yeah. Moab. Um, but second of all, I think they're going to go down the route of the the uh, Ford in this thing. Oh, so it's a traditional lock. Uh, yeah, because I don't think it's going to have three motors like the Hummer does or whatever. I think it's going to be a front one in the front, one in the back with a traditional locker. So that's how kind of I interpret it. Um, but what well, I like about this, the like... the Rivian has e-lockers, oh, the, the electronic kind. I've well, never, and you've driven that. Yeah, but it doesn't have like a lock mode. It's just terrain modes. There's no like lock it up. It's just because like, it doesn't have a traditional. Yeah, locker. but they could simulate one. They That's could what have I'm like saying. a lock I, mode. So 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 you're okay with it simulating a locker, but you're not okay with it simulating exhaust mode. Yeah, because a locker actually is functional. A locker helps you get a f- to something further. If an exhaust note made the car faster, then I'd be like, yeah, cut through that air fast. Well, and they did that too. They did a boost mode. Yeah. I just, I really they, they don't. They do the same thing. I don't, I mean, I want my stuff on my vehicle to be functional. Like the doors can come off this, right? That That's a functional thing that, that, that the vehicle can do. The, the roof will fold back. Uh, currently, you can't buy a convertible in the EV space, right? Pretty cool. They're offering that. Well, so, you, you you could if Tesla ever built their Roadster. Yeah, if they'd ever built the Roadster, that's right. <laughs> the, the new one, not the old one. So I think that this is a much. The optics of this are much, much, much better than the the Charger Daytona SRT Banshee. The other thing you don't like about the Charger Daytona SRT Banshee, this is what's kind of killing me on the inside a little bit. Is there's like nine different horsepower ratings, right, on that car? Yeah. The Charger, right? The electric Charger. Yeah. There's gonna be like nine different outputs. And some of the outputs are based off of hardware changes, but some of them are just software. And I really don't like when you have to pay extra to get a line of code that's mechanically the same as the car that's below or above it. I really think that that's... So a here's an idea. I, I was talking to one of the Jeep engineers, maybe it was Jim Morrison, about this. Because when they had, when they had that electric Wrangler, right, that we were driving in Moab, remember that? Yeah. Uh, the, what was it called? Magneto. Magneto, yeah. Uh, it actually had regular uh, transmission. You yeah. didn't need it. You could just put it in second, right? But mm-hmm. there are – if you buy a conversion, you can get a regular transmission in an electric car. Sure. Especially in a conversion, right? Yeah, so like – You what, don't need it, but you can just lock it in second and drive it. So like if you have an air-cooled Volkswagen, um, you pull out the engine and the electric motor bolts directly to the input shaft on yes. the transmission. And then you have all four gears still. Yes, and you usually lock it in a second. And well, you just stick it in second and drive it like right, a, yeah. right, because it's got so much torque that you don't need that. That's really why you need a transmission, right? But oh, yeah. Electric motors have such a wide, wide torque, torque range yeah. mm-hmm. that you don't need them. But, but I was talking to either one of the engineers or Jim, and I said, you know, wouldn't it be cool if you could, like, in an electric Jeep, deploy a transmission, 
right? Where the, actually the pedal actually comes down and the little shift lever comes up. Now you wouldn't need it and it would be completely simulated, right? So you could simulate it, but you would have the option. And then of course, Koenigsegg basically did the same thing uh, at Pebble Beach when they introduced it. But I, I was, this was at the Moab Easter Jeep Safari, I was thinking to myself, there's a little button on the dash, you push it and all of a sudden the third pedal comes down, the little shift knob comes up, and now you can simulate, or however you want to do it technically, and actually shift the vehicle. Because I like shifting, it makes me more engaged with the car. Off-road shifting isn't as good as automatic, but I still would love that ability to do that. So I was hoping that there would be something innovative in this besides just taking the doors off a renegade. That that was my... <laughs> it's not a renegade. <laughs> look, I mean, look, look, at it. look, the thing that got me excited about this is right. listen to the sentence. The capability to cross the Rubicon Trail. You're not going to be crossing the Rubicon Trail in Renegade. It's just a can't No, do you it. can if you stack up enough rocks. <laughs> yeah, you might be able to do it once, but the thing's going to be isn't, pretty... Isn't the trail rated? No, but trail rated is different than Rubicon uh, rated. I see. So trail rated just means that it has approach angle, departure angle, ground clearance, water forwarding to do like an off-road trail. Rubicon is, is way above that in the capability spectrum. You really don't like that, huh? It's uh, cool. I think it's pretty neat. All right. Compare that to a Jimny. Well, it's a very different animal. A I'm just saying style-wise, what do you like better, that or a Jimny? Um... Well, it's a kink. I can't, I mean, you, know, you can look at it. You can see what it looks like. Right. You like that or a Jimny better? Well, Which I like one the Jimny, like? but the Jimny only has two doors, and I, this is four doors. I, I'm looking at this, right? And I, I'm sorry, but I, I, it doesn't like, like, I don't get like super excited by it. Maybe when I see it in real life, it's not fair to judge it in pictures. Maybe in real life, I'll be like, wow, that's really cool. Uh, but, but the design language to me is kind of like I say, it's like a, it's like a more bigger slab sided. Renegade. Look at this puppy. Let's see. Maybe you like it more from the back. Maybe show me it from the back. Yeah. There, there's the back. See, it's got the spare tire on the rear. Did you see this too? This is a little tidbit. It's got real tow points. Uh, and check this out. Recovery it's got, points. Yeah. It's got a little four by e Moab sticker here. I, I do like the hinges. The fact that they're you know outside of the body. It's a little hummery actually in the rear. The way this whole swing gate looks like it's going to open up. Um, yeah. I don't know. I think it's. I wonder what license plate always. Always is a... You think that? It, it says B788, yo. Yeah, those are typically... Uh, if I know Mark, you probably... You think he put something incorporated in Incorporated some there's pen a, it. There's a... There's a, there's a uh, yeah. Uh, eh, eh, eh. B78... Yo. 8, yo. I don't know what that means. I'm not smart enough to figure that out. Mm. You think that there's a secret message there? There's you a could text Easter him. Egg? I could text Mark. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what does that license plate mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not going to bother Mark. Why not? Because he's probably in some meeting with Ralph and they're, you no, know. No, you text him. Or, you know, it's, it's no, I'm not going to text him it, to, to bug him about that. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not going to do that. Uh, so uh, we'll see. I, 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 I got to see it in real life. Uh, but um, I would love to see a little bit more like innovation, something unique. And I do appreciate that they, they do the traditional you know, Jeep things, but it would be cool to do something beyond that. And I think, here's the thing, right? Electrification allows you to rethink what a car is. It gives you basically a whiteboard to start all over and from fresh. You can put the batteries on the roof. You can put them underneath. You can, you know what I mean? You, you, can, you can move the, the, the bits and pieces around however you want. Uh, and most manufacturers, I think, aren't taking advantage of that. Right, especially when oh, you don't you put, put, the, like put a, a good example of that is a frunk. Put the wheels on the roof. No, I'm thinking, <laughs> like, like, like I, don't, I have no idea why in the new lyric. I well, I know what the official reasoning is. So in the lyric, there's no frunk, mm -hmm. and yet when you open up the hood, there's this, all this space there. And I talked to the chief engineer, and she said the reason there's no frunk in the lyric, which is Cadillac's new electric vehicle, is because there were all these pieces that we wanted to put under the hood that would have to live somewhere else, you know, uh, and so we wanted to have a wider um, opening in the back and more space between the, the walls in the back. So we put all that stuff in the front, and that's why we didn't do a frunk. And I looked in there, and I'm like, there's a lot of space under there. You could have done a frunk. So, uh, you know, does this have a frunk? They say it does. All right, well, that's good. Yep. At least they did a frunk. Yeah. But, you know, you could have put that spare tire in the frunk. Well, but then it would take up the whole frunk. I don't know. At least this, it's not taking up your frunk. Yeah, well, yeah. So what else, what other packaging things do you want to see? What other packaging things do I want to see on this? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you have a lot of ideas about where to put things. Do you want to, like, change the look of a vehicle? you want to, like, a cab over Jeep? 
You could. You could do like a cab a forward over. control. You could Jeep. do a forward, con- go back to that, right? During the Renaissance, you could do a forward control Jeep. I've, I've driven that. That's pretty scary because mm. you're looking down. Your feet are basically your crumple zone. So, it's not a great thing. So before we log off today, yes. we should talk about another EV we have at the office, okay. which is the new Genesis GV60. Well, that's become an EV show, not on purpose. Yeah, that's well, unfortunately, well, that, that's but, what they're all becoming nowadays. Well, well fortunately or not. That's, not that's, not that's, unfortunately. That's where, I should say that's where the market's going. That's where the innovation is. Yeah, that's where the excitement is right, right? now. Yeah. I mean, that's where everything is kind of interesting and mm-hmm. new and different versus, you know, you know, we could talk about the C-Class that's out there, the new C-Class, but it's basically just a... Older C-Class with a refresh. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a evolution of the current C-Class, not a revolution. But this is where the cool innovation, like you said, is coming. So, for example, the GV60 has a really cool feature. I really love this. Which, which is? Where it's got biometrics, so you can leave your key at home, get into the car using a facial ID camera on the B-pillar, the yep. car will unlock, and then start the car using a fingerprint pad, and then drive away. I think that's really cool. So, for example, if you're out, like, um, rafting, right, you don't want to take your key with you, you could leave the key at home altogether, lock the car, come up to the car, unlock it with your face, start it with your finger, drive off. So people, uh, you did a TikTok on that, and everybody was like, cool, but I've seen it. And I like the way you did it. You took the key and threw it in the garbage. That was smart. I don't think people have seen it. Where have they seen it? No, but the the, the comments weren't like, there was like, nobody was like, wow. Well, people worried you're going to get kidnapped and then... People are going to steal your car with your face. But I'm like, you think they could kidnap you and steal your car with your key, too. So You think that the criminals know that it has face recognition? I know. I think that's that's like a movie idea but of a kidnapping. Have, we could have a lot of criminals listening to the show today. <laughs> yes. If, if you're listening, criminals, please take off your headphones <laughs> yeah. for the next five minutes. Don't go chopping people's hands and fingers off. Uh, the, the part that was also interesting was it's got this, like... Uh, and this is what I like. I like innovation. But it's so it's so sad to see when people do innovations and the comments are so trolly and so like like and I'll give you this is a good example of it. So it's got this crystal ball. It is a crystal ball, right? And when you get in the car and you push the button, the crystal ball rotates and it gives you a dial selector. So you can, you know, then select park or drive or reverse. And then when you turn it off, it re rotates and just shows you this crystal ball. I think that's way cool. So, so Jaguar <laughs> did it right when you had a little a dial that selector popped that popped up, yeah. uh, and then it would go back. And, and and of course, the very first comment is first thing to break, which it might. So my I kind of agree with the comments though, because in my mind, innovation has to improve your life can, can, or or add something to your life. Can I right? give you an example of that? So like, yeah, I'm going to give you an example first mm-hmm. though. So like right. the facial recognition unlock the car. That's innovation in my mind because it subtracts a need for a key. The crystal ball shifter that rotates, it doesn't make my life any better. It's just potentially another thing that could go wrong. Yeah, so like like caveman invents fire. Which or, is useful. Fire f- useful. Invents fire, and then the next caveman goes, what the hell's that? You'll burn the cave down. No. <laughs> That's but what the, that is. The difference is fire was a key thing to civilization and to, to evolving mankind. It'd be like if caveman was like, oh, you invented fire, and then... He was like, but look at the shifter that rotates around and unlocks no. the car. <laughs> like, it's just, the, it doesn't improve the experience. How does that improve the vehicle experience? Well, because first of all, there was not a lot of fire around. Right now, it, the market is very competitive. So what you're doing is trying to set yourself apart Which from the like competition. Which is like the biometric thing is cool. But no one's like, I wasn't going to buy Genesis. But now that the shifter rotates, I'm buying a Genesis. Like Neanderthal man invents the wheel. And the first thing the other Neanderthal man says is, oh, you'll roll your foot over. But once again. <laughs> once again. It, it, look, everything's going to have its positive. But why, why don't you point? Why do you always have to go to the negative? You're, why not go to the positive? You're like, comparing like, this gimmicky shifter to the invention of the wheel, which is a... <laughs> a forefront you, you, of modern Tommy, civilization. You, you, you want to buy a Model T, right? Yeah. How do you ship that? How do you shift it? Yeah. With uh, with the pedal and the handle. Yeah, yeah it's horrible, right? It's this, it's this horrible, it is horrible, archaic way of shifting. And then I think Cadillac came up with the three yeah. pedal. Fantastic innovation, but it was a uh, mechanic. But I'm sure there were people who at the Model T were like, oh, my God, how, 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 what was wrong with the pedal and the, <laughs> and the stick and the rock? I'm sure. That's true. But it was actually a physical change. This this crystal ball thing that moves it's not it's cool how is it making the experience sometimes, better sometimes you know you know if anything I'm, it's worse because you have to wait for I, it to roll over i mean apple basically in a way is one of the most um uh copied and one of, one of the most uh, successful companies in the world 
because it took something that was boring and mundane and made it cool. Uh, sure, it was also more functional, but for the most part, right, phones were around a long time before the first iPhone came out, but Apple actually took it and made it cool because of the design, because of look, right, a lot, of, especially with the old computers, they did that. Yeah, right? but they also, the, they, Apple, especially during the Steve Jobs and, day, yeah. innovated through technology and through adding things to the... And now, Tommy, right, yeah. look at now what's happening. Apple's, Apple's being very safe, right? The new iPhone just came out, and it was a huge job because it's the same as the old iPhone, whereas Samsung's building foldable phones. And Apple's out there like, now you can get 50K of, you know, I can barely use 4K. Why do I have 50K? But it would be, the phone would be worse if the cameras rotated if, out of the, the, if every, the, front of the camera. If everybody thought like that, then we, you know, we'd have this, this phone, it'd be Apple, which is, you know, conservative, boring, and can't seem to innovate. Look, it's, it's, it's like a gadget. It's, it's a kind of a fun party trick to show people. But is it innovation? I'm not sure it's anyway. Innovation. Go to alttfl.com. You can see the TikTok up Here's there. Here's the thing. I, I will make to you a proposition. Yeah. I think that nobody has invented a better shifter than an old school PR and DL lever. I agree with that 100%. So why are we coming up with balls that rotate to select it when we could oh, have because, a PR because and DL? Pe because people came up with really bad ways of shifting. I was just talking to our landlord. He bought a Honda uh, Ridgeline. Yeah. He's got the buttons. He hates them. He well, absolutely yeah. hates the buttons. Sure, but I kind of feel like the knob is not. Do you remember when the knob came out on the RAM? People hated the knob, the, like the rotary knob, and then you get used to it. The buttons can't get used to. Well, you could get used to the buttons. No, the, and then, then, then the buttons weren't even invented. The buttons were already around. They failed once or maybe twice, and then they brought them back. I'm well, like, you know, you know what had buttons? The, the the magic crystal ball has not been around. You know, the 59 Edsel had buttons. Yes, I know. So it's been around for a hot sec, the buttons. Yeah, and it failed, and now they brought it back, the, and it the, still the failed. The rotating crystal ball is not going to be a, a thing that's going to Wouldn't it be funny, stay? like 20 years from now, the only way you can shift a car is a rotating crystal ball. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> and everybody's like, Wait, how do I do it? Before Apart from the rotating crystal ball, though, I do want to say the Genesis GV60, phenomenal car. It's so quick. It's so quiet. The interior is beautiful. It's got all sorts of cool design accents. Um, the pleated leather is amazing. The steering wheel, this white leather thing, I... Probably there's, wouldn't buy it, but it's amazing. There's one thing I don't like about it. The styling? No, the st I'm okay with the styling. Uh, and uh, BMW tried this, and now Genesis has do literally doubled down on this. Right, there's two buttons on the steering wheel. That you can have them be programmed or whatever you want. Yeah. Oh yeah, programmable. Right. And I think I think 90 percent of people will never program those, and they'll just create more confusion. As opposed, to, I understand what they're doing. There's so much technology, so. If you want a shortcut, you can, but nobody's going to dig in deep to figure out how to program those. And I got to tell you, Tommy, uh, we just bought, let's tell them what we bought. We never said what we bought. We just bought, you want to tell them what we bought? New stools. No, no, we just bought a 1972. Oh, yeah, Mercedes, an old um, 250C. So it's this little um, coupe from the early 1970s. And it doesn't have a crystal ball that rotates. But it's very cool. It's a baby blue. It's horizon blue. Yep. And it's got a cool blue uh, interior in it and a straight six. And it's a lot of car for a small amount of money, actually, those old 70s Mercedes. Yeah, we paid $12,000 for it. Uh, and we actually, the guy has a stack of maintenance records that are taller than you, which is cool. But one of, in that stack, we found uh, an old uh, magazine, road and track magazine, from when the car was first reviewed. Uh, and here's a fun game we can play together. All right, we're trying to play this, but let us know in the comments below if you're watching this on YouTube what you would do. So we we went and we read the review, which was actually really well done. Kind of kind of puts current reviews to shame. Made me feel bad about how how lacking our reviews are compared to like how deep they dove and how much testing they actually did. So we'll try to up our game. But at, in the back of the magazine uh, was uh, an advertising section. And what were the vehicles that were advertised and how much did they cost? Well, well so... And this, uh, is the, this is the game we get to play now. Yeah, it was pretty cool. So the Mercedes back in the day, $6,000. Yeah. Um, and then the one they tested was like $8,000. But what was cool is they had these, these old classifieds for used cars, right? And this is a magazine from 1970. And they had a whole stack of Mercedes um, 300 SLs and 300 SL gall wings that um, people were selling. And they were between like $4,500 and $5,500, which is the equivalent of like $40,000 in today's money. And now that car is worth $3 million, $4 million. They yes. also had like Ferrari 250s. Yeah, they had Ferrari GT 250s. Like used GT 250s for like $30,000, $40,000 the equivalent of. They, no, they were like, yeah, like seven or $8,000 yeah. back in the day. Yeah. So um, the so question we were asking is what 15-year-old car today is going to be worth $3 million? It's going to be the SL of that or the, or the Ferrari. In that 50 thing. years. Yeah. 
Yeah, so like those two Mercedes SLs were three and I'm, it was like I'm selling two Mercedes SLs. They were Gall Wings. Yeah, Gullwings. this guy had one and what? they were like forty five hundred and fifty five five hundred dollars. Yeah, and then the other like guy for, and then the thirty other four guy, grand today. Yeah, and then the other guy was selling uh, GT um, two fifty GT right Ferraris, yeah, which yeah. are like five million dollar cars today for like. $5,000 Yep, mm-hmm. for less than the price of a new Mercedes. So we were trying to figure out what cars you would buy today that were like 15 to 20 years old that will have that same appreciation. And I suggested maybe uh, the Jaguar uh, F-Type. You agree or disagree? I don't know. You don't think so? I, I just, I don't know. I don't feel like the F-Type's that special. Really, I think it's beautiful and I think it, it's underappreciated, especially if you get the, uh, the eight-cylinder. Yeah, because the ones you see are always a four cylinder, a six cylinder. Sorry, but if you get the eight, I think that might be the one that, that might. might I, I so my my pitch was the Tesla Roadster. Yes, your pitch was the because Tesla. I think things are going to go electric, and that was like the first car that proved to folks that electrics could be very cool and fast and impressive. So that was my pitch was the first gen Roadster. Could, another one I came up with, and they're but they're already expensive, like the like the first of the Black Series Mercedes. Oh yeah, those are very expensive. Yeah, so like an LFA Lexus. LFA might be another yeah, one. But those are like all a expensive. million dollars already. Yeah, so, so those don't count because these guys were you know relatively affordable. None of those cars are affordable. How about what was it? What was the Mercedes wagon that was kind of a hot wagon? What was that one called? What the E sixty threes? No, sorry, the uh, Lexus wagon. <laughs> um. That they, was based on the on the sports sedan. They didn't do a wagon. Yeah, they did a wagon. It was it, like the IS wagon. IS, yeah, IS wagon. I think you know. Yeah, they were just weren't that fast. Like so, they had the ISF. ISF was there. ISF wagon. Not in the states. It was a sedan. It was only. a European only, right? I don't know if they ever did a wagon in Europe. Maybe yeah. they did, but in the states, it was only sedan. Um, yeah, maybe. I think maybe like a Chrysler 300 how, S, how about, SRT8. How, how about like hot? yeah? How about like yeah? Chrysler, well, don't tell them that. We're looking for Chrysler 300 SRT. Or Magnum SRT8, even hotter, but oh, those are also expensive. A Jeep uh, Trackhawk? Yeah, that could be a good one. Yeah, this yeah. could be valuable. One. I don't think they're going to be $2 million, but they could be valuable. Could be when combustion engines are, you know, and this thing's got a Hellcat. Durango Hellcat? Same thing, SRT, could be valuable. Yeah, that's another one. Anyway, oh. let us know in the comments what you think. Although, the funny thing with Durango is they built it for one year, and they said it's never coming back, so everyone, like... Ran to buy them, like, hold on, I'm like, oh, this is collectible. And then they just came back and said, actually, we're going to do it for another year. Do you remember that? That yeah. was pretty funny. I would say four GT, but they're already Oh, cheaper. they never got cheap. They never, no, got, they never cheap, got cheap, yeah. How about, like, a, you know, here's another good one. I bet you this is the one you buy. Get a, a, get a, a GT350 Mustang or a GT500. Yeah, sure, that's probably a good bet. Yeah. Although those take a long time to appreciate. So let us know what you think in the comments. Are we missing any obvious ones? And then... Before we wrap this up, Tommy, we are doing a series of, with convertibles mm-hmm. uh, called From Dud to Stud. And, you know, we're going to talk about stud to stud dud. Dud. We're going to talk about the ones that are uh, that we, what we like. But let's save that for next time because sure we're kind of running out of time. Uh, and if you want to watch that series, it's at alltfl.com. Uh, and we are trying to reboot TFL bids. We've been having some software issues with it. so yeah. But we will be selling our FJ40 uh, on it. That's right. Uh, our classic one. So if you want a cool old FJ from the States that's never been... Uh, molested and is all original maybe too original <laughs> uh, that might be it there it is yeah look at that yep that, that's pretty cool it lived in a monastery in aspen Tommy. pretty cool yep so be sure to stay tuned for that one all right as always this is roman and tom you'll see you in the next episode ciao